Welcome to the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. I'm your host, Simone Morris, and I have a passion for empowering others to take responsibility for their careers. Yes, I've written several books on owning your career and am loving hosting this podcast. This podcast is for you if you're willing to make a shift to the driver's seat in your career. We feature leaders who inspire, empower, and motivate you for consistent career action for results. Please continue to join us every Sunday when a new episode is released. Let's get into this week's show. Welcome to this week's episode of the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. I'm so pleased to have with us today, Vanessa Rosado. We worked together many, many moons ago, and I have been a fan and and been following her career on LinkedIn. (laughs) And so excited to have her come and just tell us what she's been doing and tell us about her career story and her, her formula for owning her career and give you some resources that you can use to level up in your career. So without further ado, I want to welcome Vanessa to the show. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, Simone. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and I'm, I'm particularly excited to have this conversation because it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, oh, delightful, delightful. Let's get right into it. We, uh, audience, I want you to know that we started the conversation even before the, the <laughs> recording was on. I was like, wait a minute, Vanessa, let's get on the recording and, and have the conversation there. So, so you had a long uh, tenure in corporate America. Yes. And you decided to make some changes in your career. So tell us a bit about, you know, your background and, and your decision to pivot. Sure. So I have worked for, I've been for, very fortunate to have worked for two of the world's largest beverage companies. We met at Diageo. Um, I started at Diageo right out of business school. And it wasn't necessarily the natural next step. I, I went into business school coming from higher education. And I had worked in fundraising and higher education, and that was my passion. Um, But I went back to business school to get some skills that I felt like I needed that I didn't have. I I didn't, you know, I wanted to study things like marketing, management, economics, things that actually I hadn't studied in in undergrad. Uh, And I went to the National Society for Hispanic MBA, Nishimba. Mm, Yes, yes. It was like the first week of school. And they told me, don't worry about interviewing, just go to learn. And on the ground there, I think that I was standing in line at a Starbucks and I met two folks from Diageo. So first lesson about career is (laughs) a lot of it is serendipity um, and always be open and prepared, at least for me, because I did go down, you know, with this idea of exploration and I just started chatting with these two folks Uh, And they came by, I went to Yale School of Management because I went for nonprofit management and they came by the desk and they said, hey, you know, show us your resume. Let's chat. Come to the booth. Check out Diageo. I didn't know anything about Diageo. You know, people say Diego. Yeah, yeah. people are still saying that. I had someone say that yesterday to me and I was like, Diageo. (laughs) And you say, you know, the brands, right? I mean, it's World's Art Spirit uh, Company. Uh, At the time, it was Total Beverage Alcohol. Uh, robust wine portfolio, robust beer portfolio uh, with some very iconic brands like Guinness, Smirnoff, Johnny Walker. And uh, and I actually ended up interviewing on the ground in Ashimba and getting uh, my MBA summer internship out of that experience. And mm. I and I sort of fell into marketing. It was an area I was always interested in, you know, working in fundraising. I did a lot of direct communication and a lot of it was about segmentation and audience analysis. And, you know, I always say customer understanding. I mean, for me, the customer then was the donor, but so it was a very natural transition and it really piqued my curiosity. I fell in love with the company, fell in love with the industry. And I had the good fortune to go back, to be invited back for a full-time role. And I stayed at Diageo for I think it was six years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I wanted, you know, and in that time I had a great training. I think for me, that's another thing in career and looking for career opportunities is to always be learning. I like to work at learning organizations, I like to work in organizations that are going to challenge and stretch me and help me build skills. Mm-hmm. And we can talk a little bit more about um, why that's so important, particularly now when uh, things are changing so much 
especially for marketers, but really in every industry, just the pace of change is totally unprecedented. So being in an environment and exposing yourself to environments where you're going to learn and grow as a professional is just fantastic as a, you know, just a rule of thumb for yourself. And for me, at least that was true. Um, but worked as an associate brand manager, got to work on some iconic brands, Smirnoff, Tanqueray, Don Julio, and brands in very different positions. You know, at the time uh, on Smirnoff, in their malt beverage business, it was very much about managing the decline, which is one very specific set of skills for marketers. On um, Tanqueray, it was a total turnaround uh, on a really beautiful brand and getting to try lots of new things, particularly in the digital space. And then on Don Julio, it was a brand that was really growing and it was about how do we accelerate that growth. So at least from a skill set for marketer, I got to exposed to a lot of different aspects of the business and uh, ways that brands can be managed, which is just really great. And then I got a phone call uh, from a headhunter. So again, you know, we all sort of joke, you know, get this phone call, you get the email, you ignore it, do you not ignore it? At the time, I loved my job. I mean, I had a dream job on a dream piece of business, working with a team that was really fantastic and amazing. A lot of people I still keep in touch with today. Uh, but they piqued my curiosity because they said, look, there's an opportunity to work in global marketing for AB and Bev. And I really wanted to travel the world. I wanted to learn other markets. I wanted to, again, learn new things for myself. And I took the call. And that changed the complete trajectory of my career in that um, I accepted a job as a content strategist, which was very in line with what I was doing at the time uh, in terms of you know, where marketing was heading. And um, four days into that job, I was and I'd flown to St. Louis for a business trip with my boss at the time, Pedro Earp, who's now the global CMO. And he, he texted me, you know, come have a beer with me on the roof. Uh, so I go for a beer. And, you know, three, four days in, he said, how would you like to have a completely different job? It's not the job you got hired for. It's not the job you interviewed for. But how would you like to uh, build digital capability globally and digital, you know, I became a marketer in the advent of, or the era of Facebook just starting, um, Twitter just starting, a lot of the new social media, digital media platforms, a lot of experimentation on YouTube. And so I had, that was a big passion area for me. He said, you can work with three big platforms to basically travel around the world and help build the skill set that marketers will need to market, to connect with consumers in the future. I mean, in the present, right? Because it was all exploding, but but in the future and help the business navigate digital transformation. I'm going to jump in here, Vanessa. Yeah. You were saying a lot of good stuff. And I, I, I'm i taking the listeners, I want you to know I'm taking notes on my flip chart and, and I'm like, all right, I've got to stop her because she's got a lot of nuggets, but I want to circle back and just get some clarification points and then yeah, we can yeah. move forward. So the first thing you said that really piqued my curiosity was about the um, Nishimba at the time, it's yeah. called something else now, that yeah. conference and the opportunity and being open, just showing up and being yourself. So talk to us about, you know, I, I know you talked about going just to learn, but you were able to do something that, you know, others cannot do which is go to a conference where they don't know anyone, meet someone and impress them. And, and voila, you've got an internship. So what happened or what can you recommend to our audience about how to take networking opportunities and really squeeze the juice out to get results? Yeah, it's very interesting because at the time I had a lot, I had a couple of friends who had gone through business school already and it was not a natural transition for me, actually. It was something that I was very curious about, um, but it wasn't necessarily easy for me. It, it wasn't the way my brain worked at the time. Um, and I always, I sought out a lot of advice. So that's the first thing I would say. You know, I asked, um, I was the first year, I asked a lot of the second years, you know, what is Nishimba, people who had been before. And that's something that I've done throughout my career, Simone, because I've been in different roles where I've had to push the boundaries and take people into places that are beyond their comfort zone and things that I didn't even necessarily know about. Um, and so I think, you know, seeking out people who have the knowledge and asking questions um, don't be afraid to demonstrate that you don't know. I think it's one thing to be, you know, if you're, you have a, a report due with your boss, it's one thing to not know in that environment, like, right, you have to have it. But it's another thing, if you're in an environment where 
uh, you're supposed to be the one asking the questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions and seek out advice. So I had gotten a lot of advice about Nishimba that was, you know, have your resume ready, do some practice interviewing, have your story. Mm. So you always got to have your story, right? Uh, in terms of who your brand is and what you want. It's amazing how many times you can talk to people and you know, it's like, they're not giving me what I want, but it's because we're not asking and we're not telling people what our goal is. Um, so that was my first thing. Uh, seek out advice and knowledge from others who have it and can share it with you. Um, be open. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I remember the career office uh, person who was traveling with us at the conference, you know, I was first year and I remember looking at her when they invited me over to the booth and she said, I said, but, but, but I, you know, I thought I wasn't going to get a chance to interview this weekend. She's like, just go, just go with them. <laughs> <laughs> I grabbed my portfolio and I just went, you know, and um, so that's it. I think know your story, be clear about what you want and be open and seek out that advice from the folks who know and, and, and take it. Mm. The other question, thank you for that. The other question that came up for me is you talking about transferring your skills. So you were in, um, you know, fundraising you talked about, but now here you've parlayed that into a marketing opportunity and off you are on this new journey. There are listeners out there who are in one space and wanting to know, how do I package to tell that story that you talked about so that I am considered for opportunities when maybe that's not my, my industry, my function, et cetera. Can you give us some tips around that? Absolutely. I will say it's not easy and I, and I don't want to be flipping about it and I don't want it to sound like, poof, it was like a magical thing and then it happened. Um, I think that really practicing and I think that's something when we're students that we're we're almost like primed to do because mm -hmm. you know we think we have the time or we think it's more of our responsibility or role but even as we advance in our career you know making sure that you take the time to write out those points of connection okay how does that skill translate to this skill you know this new new industry or this new role that I want to take on has these different requirements but I have all of these functional capabilities and they actually translate mm -hmm. sometimes we take for granted that other people can make the connections and it's really the onus is on us to mm -hmm. draw that picture for them and to help them understand look this is what I did, this is how it relates, and this is how it can apply to what you need someone to do in that role. The other thing I will say, um, and I will give her a shout out very specifically, my sister Diane has been an HR professional her entire career. And when I was in business school, I would call home, you know, I'd call her and say, I mean, it's gonna be so hard. Everybody just keeps telling me, it's gonna be impossible. What I wanna do is impossible. To do these changes, to have this different, to have this pivot, once I realized that I wanted to get into marketing full-time. And she said, don't listen to people. Mm. <laughs> and in that case, I mean, I know I just said take advice, but in other words, don't listen to negativity or blockers. And, and you have to find that story and tell it. But once you actually peek behind the curtain, and you start, again, asking a lot of questions. Ask other people their career story. Well, how did you get here? Mm. What did you do before? What I realized in that process, I met a lot of people who were working in marketing that had different backgrounds. Oh, I was an actress. Oh, I worked actually at a nonprofit. Oh, I worked for the government before. And who actually had been on a very similar journey. And so, again, that helped me to formulate those points of connections by learning from the stories of others. Mm, I'm learning right now, listeners. I, I love this. I love this seat because I, I learn continuously, which is one of the things that you talked about. And I know I need to go to commercial break, but I want to tie the bow here because I'm telling you, you said so many good nuggets. I had to take notes. The other one is that social request. You mentioned your boss said, come and have a beer with me. Yeah. And there are some of us who are like, you know what? I'm, I, <laughs> I'm tired. I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow in the office. Yeah. And so we pass on opportunities. I did take that lesson from my time at Diageo, the yeah. importance of networking in the ecosystem or, you know, whatever is the rule or unwritten rule, written or unwritten rule for the organization. So you were invited to come and have a beer and talk about your career. And you said yes. So talk to us about, you know, say that goes back to being open to new things and hearing it. Yeah. I, I think part of it was 
to be honest, the training of, you know, fundraising is a very social industry and then going into marketing specifically in the alcohol industry. I mean, marketing in and of itself, marketing, advertising, very social. A lot of it's based on relationships, um, but particularly in alcohol. So I, and I do think as I've gotten more senior in my career too, and as life has become more complicated, right? Mm -hmm. Getting married, I have a young son, he's two. This is not necessarily something that I always want to do now. I think back then, to be honest, it was easier to say yes in a lot of these environments. But I did, I had a couple of really good bosses, um, especially at Diageo. And I think the first one for me was, you know, Christian McMahon, who came with a sales background. And it was very clear, you know, you've got to get out there, you've got to build relationships, you've got to make the time. And in that capacity, it was, you know, spend time in the market, spend time with retailers, spend time with the distributors. But that always translated for me. You know, if you have an opportunity to sit down face to face with someone and chat with them outside of the office, predominantly, uh, you're going to get, you're going to learn new things about them. Again, you're going to learn about their career. You might hear about new opportunities for you. Um, and I was actually just reading, I'm reading this book uh, called the Black Swans. And it talks about this role of serendipity and luck. And there's so much more of it that may happen if you, if you go and, you know, have that beer, have that lunch, have a coffee, you know, have a sparkling water, whatever. Mm. But create that opportunity to sit down with someone who may mentor you or may have an opportunity that you don't even know about. And then you're in a position to learn about it. Mm, awesome. Awesome. It's so good. I don't want to take a break, but we are, <laughs> uh, you, I, you're going to be invited back. I already know it because we've got a lot more to talk about, not a lot of time, but a lot more to talk about. So let's take a short break and listeners will be right back to talk more about what resources really help Vanessa to level up in her career. So We'll be right back. Hi there. I hope you're enjoying this episode. This interview is amazing. I, I do so love it. I want to just jump in and let you know a couple ways that you can work with me. First of all, you can always go to connectwithsimone.com and it will give you the opportunity to get to my books, uh, website, etc. If you want to sit down and have a conversation about your career directly, you can go to careerbreakthroughcall.com and book a free 30 minute call with me to talk about, you know, what's happening in your career. Do you need help with building your confidence? Do you need help with identifying uh, strategic relationships that you need for career success? Do you need help building a career plan? Whatever it is, I'm sure that I can help. So do go to careerbreakthroughcall.com and set up a time for us to have a conversation. Again, it's a free 30 minute call to have a conversation. That's it for now. Let's get back to the interview. So we are speaking to Vanessa Rosada. Vanessa, I want you to know I remember your middle name. I don't know why. <laughs> I think it's from communications at Diageo, but it's Yvette, right? Yeah, that's right. All right. And now what's so funny is when I joined the company that I am at now, Venture Fuel, there was already a Vanessa. It's like the first time in my life. So my email is Vanessa Yvette actually now. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. I, I used to say the same thing about Simone. I'm like, I am the only Simone. Now, of course, there's, you know, Simone Biles. There's another Simone that's a swimmer, Olympic swimmer. And so it's becoming well, more see. common. I listened to your episode. You're like all the Simone Morrises that you encountered when you're like building your personal brand. So use the middle name. That's use right. The middle initial. That's right. So Simone E. Morris, everybody. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my goodness. So Vanessa is dropping all the gems on this episode. We've not even talked to her about the pivot. Let's talk about the pivot before we run down yeah. the road to resources. Yeah. So you've done a pivot now yeah. in terms of uh, industry, et cetera. Tell us a bit more about the decision to embrace the new opportunity, new learning. Yeah. So about a year ago, my role at AB and Bev was eliminated. And I think for me, it was, we were talking about this a little bit. It was a little bit liberating because I was on a corporate track and I was doing something that I loved. And I will say this, uh, I worked with amazing teams and there was a point in my career at AB and Bev where I was on the road upwards of 50% of the time going to London, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, uh, you know, Johannesburg. I mean, 
the most amazing places and in an industry where I, I really was getting an opportunity to get out, see the market, meet people, um, and have really interesting experiences on a personal and a professional level. Um, but my personal life changed. And I think, you know, you cannot dis disassociate the two things. We talk a lot of, everybody talks a lot about work-life balance. There's work okay. and there's life, and then there's balance. I'm not sure that they meet ever, but yeah. you know, you got to figure out what's right for you. And so, uh, I had a son, he's two years old. He's amazing. I love him. <laughs> and I didn't want to be, uh, on the road, uh, internationally up to 50% of the time anymore. And I also wanted to challenge myself to learn new and different things. So a passion point that developed for me while I was at ABM Bev was technology and innovation and collaborating with startups. I'd run a couple of startup competitions um, at South by Southwest for the company. And I'd done a couple of things in terms of innovation and technology, like building capabilities within the teams, the marketing teams and the commercial teams around that space. Uh, and right around that time, after I left ABI, uh, my husband actually runs an innovation, independent innovation consultancy, and he asked me to help him do some repositioning. And I just said, okay, I'll do it, you know, just to keep my brain engaged uh, while I take some time off to spend with our son. Uh, and then as I was getting ready to start interviewing again, he said, you know, how about come and work with me, work in this space that you're really passionate about. Uh, doing B2B marketing, which is something new for you, so you can continue to grow your skill set in the startup space, which is something you're really curious about. Um, and we can build this business together. And I think it was a great opportunity, A, to pivot, to learn B2B marketing. My role at AB InBev had been actually almost like internal consultancy. And so it felt very natural actually to go into this space, helping other business leaders find solutions to problems that they had. And I spent a lot of time working in creativity as well, which creativity and innovation are close siblings uh, in terms of, you know, how do you think differently? How do you find new ways to solve old problems? So it was an exciting pivot for me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, so we haven't really talked about the formula. So you've yeah. had all these different experience. What would you say your formula is for successfully owning your career? think that curiosity, and I don't know, it, it might sound like a cliche, right? But having the intellectual curiosity to explore and pursue things that are not necessarily, you know, a linear evolution one to the next. I had a lot of great mentors throughout my career who talked about that. You know, you, you don't have to necessarily go in one straight line. In fact, it's much more interesting often to zig and zag and find your way. Um, but my formula for success, I think that's it. You know, there, there is always a component of hard work and sacrifice. I think people talk a lot about that, but I feel like that is table stakes. Um, and then always be learning. Uh, I know you're going to ask about resources and I don't want to jump around, but it was something that, uh, you know, when I, when I took the job in digital capability at ABI, I was going around the world working with our regional CMOs. And in every country that I went to, they each had you know, a list of books that they were either reading in the moment or that they had read, they were recommending to their teams. And we built a long bibliography. And for me that, um, I'm always trying to read, you know, be reading something new, uh, reading things in spaces adjacent to where my core competency is to make sure I'm always learning. And that I think would be the biggest resource for me is just, make sure that you are always um, reading, watching, listening, exposing yourself to new ideas uh, so that you can continue to challenge the status quo for yourself and not ever get comfortable. Um, and I mean, it's a cliche, right? But not rest on your laurels because that's when I think you can lose your way in your career and end up just doing what you think you should be doing mm. rather than taking the risk and going out there and doing what's genuinely going to make you happy. Mm. Talk to us about risk, Vanessa. I, I had another question in mind and then you said the word risk. How do you build an appetite for taking risk? Because you have traveled all around the world and you, this is, this means you've had to say yes to a lot of new things that in some cases are quite risky. So how do you build the muscle to build your risk, muscle, risk appreciative muscle in your career? 
think that there were moments for me personally when I told myself it's what I had to do in a good way. Like, you know, I have to go to Moscow and give that training. I have to, you know, but you do realize you have choice. And I, and I had a good friend who would always say that, you know, we, we choose and we make the time to do the things that are important to us. Mm. Um, but I built that risk tolerance or ability over time. I am in my personal life, a naturally risk averse person. Um, but I think that I knew that there were experiences that I wanted to have in my professional life. And I also, I feel very strongly that, uh, the only thing that is constant is change. Mm -hmm. And if an opportunity arises and you don't take advantage of it and, you know, open one opportunity knocks, I'm filled with the cliches today, Simone, but it's true. <laughs> They're good. They're very good. Um, <laughs> and you might not get that opportunity again, you know? And so um, the only one I said no to, uh, I was invited and I'm not going to say the country because I love all countries and all places. And, uh, but I was invited to, participate as a facilitator in a workshop during a revolution in a country and I was like I'm good guys I'm gonna stay home and that's when my mom was like you cannot go like, you cannot. but I mean I was I mean I was in um I was in a country once uh trying to get home and the airports were shut down because of national strikes I was in another place where riots broke to, broke out you know on a national holiday I mean and you see a lot of things, but also, I mean, the same things happened in New York. I was in, I was eight months pregnant when the city shut down I got, and the subways went out and all that, you know, you just everywhere, these things happen. And I think also that realization, and I'm making myself sound super brave. The first time I took an international trip to a place I'd never been before. I remember with actually like a little bit of embarrassment, asking one of the local team members, like a really stupid question about how to get around, you know, but you learn. Um, and then you realize that there is a risk inherent in our lives every day, mm -hmm. um, but there's not necessarily that same level of opportunity every day. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Your answers are authentic. And so there's value. Our listeners are getting value from this interview. I want to ask you about those books you talked about. You said it was a long yeah. list from different countries. Give us some of the key highlights, some books that you would recommend to our listeners. There, there are like, there's a short list that are very top of mind for me right now because of what I'm doing. But, uh, and some of these, again, they're not necessarily new titles that uh, people haven't heard of, but very few people I find actually go out and read them. Um, so The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, I think is a big one, which is helping people understand uh, why organizations don't innovate, industry leading enterprise organizations don't innovate, why the actual challenges that they face and giving some recommendations on how to work around that. A uh, book Al Reese wrote called Positioning, and I think it's the original book on positioning, um, which to be honest, some of the examples now are hilarious because they're so outdated, but it helps you to understand that what a brand is, is actually the perception that someone has of it in their mind. And it's not necessarily a lot of what we put into a, onto a brand, you know, we think comes from those of us who own the brand, mm. but it's actually the consumer owns the brand at the end of the day. And I think that's a really powerful lesson as a marketer. Mm. Um, and then I'm trying to think of a really good third one. Cause the other thing too, is I don't always just read books about industry or marketing or capability. Um, I also, and there was a good friend of mine, it was a one of the global VPs at ABI. And she always said this, she has the public library app on her phone. And so she just always has a book, a work of fiction. She's reading something to also just free up your mind um, because that is something else that we don't think about. And there's a journalist called Manoush Samarodi who did a study with New York Public Radio and she wrote a book about it. That is the book I'm gonna try and remember the name of, uh, but she, basically did this research that said, with all of the digital media and all of the mobility in terms of technology, we have eliminated any downtime from our day. And the downtime is the moment when your brain puts together, it connects disparate ideas and actually creative new thoughts emerge. So um, Bored and Brilliant is the name of the book and I would recommend it. 
And just because it's fascinating. So she, as a journalist, goes out and does all this research and she talks to neuroscientists and she talks to social scientists and she talks to anthropologists and just, she talks to everybody you could think of related to this issue. And she says, listen, we got to put the devices down. We got to put social media down. We got to take a step back from all of this overwhelming of our brain if we want to be able to continue to have original thought and creativity. And so I would also say, you know, don't just read business books, although I love them, um, but also carve out some time for your own personal inspiration, wherever that may come from. Absolutely. Absolutely. This has been an amazing interview. Uh, as we wrap up, Vanessa, can you tell our audience how they can stay connected with you if they'd like to do so? Absolutely. So I'm actually most active on LinkedIn. So I would say um, you can connect with me or follow me on LinkedIn. And I share a lot of what I'm working on these days in terms of innovation and a lot of the interesting conversations that I'm having with folks in the industry. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Vanessa, for being a guest on the Power of Owning Your Career podcast. It has been an absolute delight. Thank you, Simone. It's been a lot of fun. I sincerely hope that you enjoyed this week's empowering career story on the podcast. If you did, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Wherever you listen to the podcast, be sure that you are subscribing and that you rate and review the podcast. It's so important as we continue to spread the word of career empowerment. In addition, you can head over to the LinkedIn platform and join the Power of Owning Your Career discussion group. There you can have access to the guests who have been on the podcast, as well as others listening to the podcast, as well as myself, where we can continue the conversation. I hope to see you on that platform. You can also email me at pooyc at simonemorris.com if you have a suggestion for guest or a message that you want me to hear personally. Thanks so much and make it an inspiring, empowering week in your career.